such a special guest today. How many were there last night to hear somebody named Swami Bhagavananda? <laughs> Some of you were. I was there. It was wonderful. You know, as a Gemini, I know what it's like to have two people inside here. <laughs> Unfortunately, in my case, neither are very interesting. But, <laughs> but in, this, in our speaker's case, they are very, both, both very interesting. So how many woke up in the middle of the night and just got one of the jokes he told us? <laughs> Am I the only one, really? Oh, well. You think I'm standing here to introduce Steve Behrman, but actually I'm here to introduce his lovely wife, Trudy, who is going to then introduce her wonderful husband. So let's give a hand for Trudy. It was about six years ago when uh, Steve and I met Bruce Lipton and his wonderful wife, Margaret. And two minds, two hearts, as well as Margaret and I, getting together. It was really an amazing thing. And they started talking. And what ended up out of that conversation is a book called Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future and a Way to Get There from Here. And it's really a book that looks back. It's a book for our times at this change of era that we've just uh, gone through. And it's also that, that change of from caterpillar to butterfly, which we've also gone through. And this is a book that'll, uh, the book in Steve's talk this morning presentation will be on the good news and how to surf these times. And these are, these are our times. These are what we've been waiting for. So let's please welcome Steve. Bearman. I love it. This is an excellent, excellent community. Uh, you know, I get asked to speak in front of so many uh, church groups that people ask me if I'm an ordained minister. It turns out I was a minister in a past life, so I'm preordained. <laughs> Now, this is my kind of spiritual community, strictly non-dominational. So. <laughs> and it's a three-way three spiritual community for me. First of all, it's a synagogue on Saturdays, it's a church on Sundays, and it's a shrine to the Brooklyn Dodgers. So, <laughs> that was my religion as a kid, basically. So, Spontaneous Evolution, when Bruce and I started writing this book, um, we thought of spontaneous evolution as a noun in the future. And uh, we now recognize it as a verb in the present. Uh, as the Swami said last night, uh, the shift has hit the fan. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the predicted changes are in the process of happening right now. Uh, as Bruce would say, crisis precipitates evolution. And if we look around us, we see the chances of precipitation are 100%. <laughs> because there is a mega crisis in every aspect of, of our lives, uh, from the planetary ecosystem to the human ecosystem. And they're really all related. So today I'm going to tell you about something called a universal love story that's based in modern science and ancient spirituality. And then we're going to see perhaps a passageway to what my good friend Charles Eisenstein calls the beautiful world that we know is possible. So, um, once upon a time, uh, the first life, how did life begin on this planet? It began with Father, Son, and Mother Earth. It began with a spark of light interacting with the matter in the material world, matter, mother, mater, material world creating something called photosynthesis, creating the first spark of life. And the first organisms were single-cell organisms. Anybody remember that? <laughs> Who remembers being a single cell? It was rough. I didn't make a single cell. It was very difficult. And so after billions of years of life being just one single cell, something happened. It was time for a next level. Now, that was act one of life on this planet. Act two, these single cells, who apparently were tired of being single, 
decided to be in a relationship, and they began to cluster together as multiple cell organisms. And what that did was it gave them greater awareness, you know, because you know, one cell has the awareness of one cell, more than one cell has the awareness of more than one cell, and this connection and community created the first multiple cell organisms. Act three was when these multiple cell organisms became very complex, like you and me. We are a, uh, a community of 50 trillion cells. Now imagine that. You know, this is, you know, when we look in the mirror, we think of ourselves as a, as a person, but really, we are a community. And uh, our cells are so well organized that everything works. You know, we have universal health care, full employment, no cell left behind. It's a big deal. And the organs cooperate with each other. You never hear about the liver invading the pancreas, demanding the islets of Langerhans. It simply doesn't happen. So in this third act of, uh, of, our, of life on this planet, we've become very, very complex organisms. And, you know, it's interesting, I mean, the, 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 in, in our system, you know, the liver cell doesn't wonder how the skin is doing. The cells simply assume that all of these other systems are working. Uh, so there's not worry, there's not like, a cell isn't worried where its next ATP is coming from, it just simply is. Well, then there, the fourth act is organisms like ourselves um, becoming involved with uh, collecting with other organisms, like, uh, you know, uh, packs of wolves or herds of cow or, or uh, schools of fish or flocks of birds or tribes of humans. Now, we can see where our tribalism has gotten us uh, at this point. Um, we were involved in what could only be called autoimmune dysfunction. Uh, in many ways, because we have tribe against tribe. And right now we're in the midst of a four-act play. Now, what did the Greeks call a four-act play? Tragedy. 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 But the Greeks had a five-act play. That was called comedy. Comedy. So the crucifixion was a tragedy, the resurrection was a comedy. Five-act play, another act added on. So, um, Biology is telling us, the fractal repeating patterns of evolution is telling us that the next phase of human evolution is recognizing that we're all cells in a super organism called humanity. This is really, you know, this is a very, very powerful idea. This is something that, uh, you know, Bruce, in looking at the patterns of evolution, how they play out, that's where we're going. If we make it, if we make it. Uh, now, somebody asked Swami, you know, are we going to make it? Is it really going to, are, are we going to actually um, evolve to this point? And uh, in order to answer that question, uh, Swami has had to channel uh, a conversation between um, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Willie Mays, the baseball player, uh, being interviewed by Howard Cosell. And I'll channel the interview. It went like this. We're talking with Willie Mays. Willie, let me ask you this. Are the Giants going to win the pennant this year, Willie Mays? And Willie Mays said, I don't know, Howard. That's what we're going to play this season to find out. <laughs> so here we are uh, at an amazing time. You can always tell the psychics they're laughing at the next joke. <laughs> so we're, in, we're here on the planet at a very, very amazing time. Uh, one, of, one of your uh, cohorts here in Ashland is my friend Jean Houston. And uh, Jean, has talk, she talks about the hero's journey uh, and the, the power of that, uh, of that story and that mythos. And right now, we as a species are having our hero's journey. Because we have so much impact as a species. You know, we're, our footprint is so big, big, you can call us Bigfoot. Do, 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 you know, stomping all over things without being aware of what we're doing. And so now, what we need is the consciousness uh, to be able to think like a species. And even more important, we need to have the heart, the coherence, and the love 
to begin to act like we are all connected. Now, a lot of people, maybe not people in this room, but people out there would say, oh, that is so utopian. Think of it this way. What we would call utopian, our body would call health. I love the word sanity, because sanity is not something that people vote on. It's not like, you know, you know it's not like, well, everybody here believes in, uh, you know, in going and killing people in other countries. That's sane. No, sanity originally comes from the same word as sanitation, sanitarium. It means health. And so, anything that we would call sane has to have the vibration and the coherence of love, health, and well-being. So, we're not in a sane society. As Swami said last night, I am proposing a sane world. I must be crazy. Because everything is, is upside down. I mean, if you think about it, you know, things are upside down. Um, institutions seem to be doing the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. But that's because our current way of being is based on what the Swami would call lowest common denominator. <laughs> it's me or you. It's me or you. And we are now on the threshold of holding some thresh. We're now on the threshold of actually making that shift in consciousness a critical mass of the heretofore uncritical masses beginning to recognize that we are all in this together. Now what's interesting is that people are talking about these times as apocalyptic. It's a great word. Apocalypse. You know what it really means? It means the lifting of the veils. The lifting of the veils. And so here we are in these times, the veils are being lifted on uh, the various forms of toxicity that human beings have done to one another. They're being lifted on the awful truths but also on the awesome opportunities. Think about what's happened in the past 25 or 30 years. We've had these spiritual paths that have been largely kept in protective custody open up to us. You know, when I was a kid, and I went to synagogue, nobody told me about the Kabbalah. You know, and here's, here's Madonna, who's doing a Kabbalah. A singer, not the mother of God. You know. <laughs> And then we've had the Hopi elders saying, you know, we've kept this stuff. Folks, we need it. Here it is. We've had various forms of shamanism, various forms of uh, Qigong and Tai Chi and Vedic medicine all become available to us in the last quarter century as healing tools that we will need to begin to connect with one another and to begin to trust our human nature. You know, somebody said, well, is human nature uh, good or evil? And the answer is, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. Human nature is everything. And so the big question is, how do we create institutions and connections that bring out the better part of human nature? After World War II, there was, uh, there was a, a severe kind of a spiritual uh, questioning. And, uh, you know, many, many Jewish people said, well, you know, if, if there is a God, if there is a loving God, how could that God allow something like the Holocaust to happen? And in, in Christianity, there was something that developed called process theology. Is anybody familiar with process theology? Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr was one of the formulators of this. And this said that it's not so much about there being a second coming or anything like that. What it really means is that we bring the spirit of God, the spirit of love, to the earth. If we don't bring it, it doesn't happen. So it's not like somebody's going to come down in a spaceship and save us. We have met the Messiah, and it is us. So this idea of process theology, it's kind of like evolving from children of God to adults of God, recognizing that we have the responsibility, the ability to respond to actually recognize that human nature is all of these things, and we choose through our actions, through our beliefs, through our words, through our deeds, through what we spend our money on, through what we spend our attention on, to bring forth the power of love, knowing that there are all of these other powers. Um, there's been so much energy fighting against things, and there's a good reason, because there's a lot of negativity on the planet, a lot of things that are... Um, 
causing vexation like the GMOs and all of these other things. At the same time, the big question is, and what would we like instead? And what are we creating instead? It's so much more powerful to be creating an attractor like that. So if we begin to look at this next phase of human life, this next phase of civilization, yeah, I love that, that Gandhi quote. Uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi, uh, what is your opinion of Western civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> I approve of that idea. So I think it's very, very important that we recognize that every moment we have a choice. It's an evolutionary choice whether we feed love or whether we feed fear. And the good news is love is more powerful than fear. Otherwise, we'd be saying, all you need is fear. <laughs> she fears you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the choice that we have in, in the moment is to recognize, are we building something that brings people together? Or are we allowing our own fears to create separation? It's a really, really interesting conversation because there are so many things out there that are pulling us toward separation. You know, as the Swami said last night, we have a deeply divided body politic. Half the population believe our elections are broken. The other half believe that they're fixed. <laughs> and we've been divided into these two political tribes, the red tribe Republicans, blue tribe Democrats, spending all of their energy arguing about whether it's worse to kill the born or the unborn. But what really needs to happen is something that hasn't happened yet. And that is for people to come to recognize the virtues and values that 90% of us hold in common. But we've not been able to do that because we've been separated by a mainstream media that's a brainwashing machine stuck on spin. So we have to overgrow. We're not overthrowing anything. We don't need a revolution to overthrow. We need an evolution to overgrow to become bigger than, to look at the higher perspective and recognize that we are all connected. And if, uh, if enough people in this country gather around those values, transcending the left and right, we will isolate the sociopathogens. <laughs> or as the Swami would say, we need to bring red tribe and blue tribe together to sit in sacred circle to talk until they're purple in the face. <laughs> Because only by staying together as one purple people will the peeps outnumber the perps. <laughs> now the value of humor, the value of humor is that it's encouraging. It means it creates courage. When we laugh, something very, very interesting happens. We start breathing. Laughing causes breathing. And as we all know, breathing is the key to long life. <laughs> Right? We breathe in, we inspire, we don't, we expire. So, <laughs> and if you notice how many, how many fear-based things there are out there. You know, if you, if you, um, if you turn to that side of the dial, um, uh, the right-wing radio side of the dial, it is engendering fear. It keeps producing fear. Fear of the other, fear of the other. And it, what happens with fear is it narrows the mind. It puts us in fight or flight. We're not thinking very clearly. But when we laugh, it brings oxygen to the brain. More synapses start synapping. <laughs> we have more creativity. We have more capacity. And so uh, we've got a number of, this is a, there's a number of transpartisan endeavors going on here in, in Ashland. I think that's really very positive because what we're doing is we're coaxing people out of their fearful positions. Um, I saw this, I was, we were in Florida, and there was a pickup truck, uh, and they had a, the sign, the, the bumper sticker was, um, I'm not a liberal. And I'm thinking, well, the liberal that that guy is not doesn't really exist. Just as the conservative that many people here imagine exists doesn't really exist. They're both really stereotypes. 
you're both really straw men or straw women, to make it equal. And, the, and so once you begin to gather past these kinds of um, designations, something happens. Uh, my friend Patricia Sung, I don't know if you know Patricia, she's a great teacher. And about uh, 20 years ago, she was speaking at a New Age bookstore, and there were four fundamentalist Christian pickets outside picketing. And she says, I'm going to go talk to these people. And the bookstore owner says, you can't talk with those people. And she said, I'm going to do it anyway. And so she went out, and she talked with them for about 10 or 15 minutes. And three of the four picket picketers put down their signs, hugged her, and said, you're saying just what Jesus said. The fourth one kept the sign. So then, it, to me, I came up with something called the, uh, the Law of 75 that 75% of people are susceptible to the power of love and respect. Maybe 25 is, you know, maybe they're not, but that's okay. 75, three quarters majority, that's pretty, pretty darn good majority. Just this past week, something very similar happened. Joan Baez was performing somewhere, and there were four Vietnam veterans, rather grizzled at this point, who are picketing her because she betrayed her America, blah, blah, blah. And um, so she went out to talk with them. And she brought her manager, who is a Vietnam veteran himself, and um, you know, he, he said, you know, uh, this one album that Joan Baez did, all of the proceeds from that album went to support Vietnam veterans. And they had a conversation. And uh, I think, once again, three of the four picketers hugged her and said, would you sign my picket sign? <laughs> and she says, yeah, I'll sign the flip side of the sign, not the one that says I'm a traitor to the country. <laughs> and the fourth one, you know, wouldn't let go. So what I'm saying is that most human beings are susceptible to love. You know, we have this, uh, one, of the, one of the great theorists of our time, uh, Ken Wilber, you know, talks about the, the various phases of, uh, of consciousness and awareness. I think he's largely right, but I think the one thing that he misses, the one thing that he misses is that regardless of what your consciousness is, regardless of how sophisticated your civilization is, everybody is um, connected at the heart. And through that power of love, and speaking from that power of love, and connecting from that power of love, we have the ability to unite at least 75% of humanity. And that's a pretty good start. So that's where we are right now. We're at, the, we're at the point where we can expect that there's going to be more crises, more separation, um, more of everything. You know, things get better and better and better, and they get worse and worse and worse simultaneously. And our mission and our job is to keep our center, to keep connected, and to appreciate the power of love and the power of humor. Because the power of humor is something that gives us perspective. Um, I don't know if I told this story. I think I probably told it last time. I'm going to tell it again because it's such a powerful story. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Americans and Soviets were meeting to discuss possible trade between the two countries. When news of the missile crisis hit, everything stopped, and there was tremendous tension in the room. Finally, one of the Soviet delegates raised his hand and very timidly said, I suggest we each go around and tell a joke. And he volunteered to start. His joke was, what's the difference between capitalism and communism? In capitalism, man exploits man. In communism, it's the other way around. <laughs> and naturally, the trance of separation was broken, and everybody burst out laughing, and they were able to connect and, and to continue their business. You know, we are at a point right now where in this country, one of the only ways to tell the truth is through humor. You know, people get their news through Jon Stewart and Colbert and... Bill Maher, et cetera, et cetera, because um, that is one of the ways that we can face the truth, that there are so many veils that, that are yet to be lifted, that are partially lifted, and 
there is tremendous confusion. Because, uh, I mean, in my background is political science. Although, I have to confess, I never actually got to dissect a politician. <laughs> That's in a very advanced course. <laughs> But one of the great principles that I've observed in political science, uh, Lord Acton said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's like one of, the, one of the laws, it's like the law of gravity. And we have to face the fact that uh, we have had a secret government operating in this country since a couple of years after the end of World War II. And we've had, until now, um, what the Swami would call a don't ask, don't tell policy. We promise not to ask our government what they're doing, and they promise not to tell them. <laughs> now this sounds very, very dark, and it is. The way to light up the darkness is through the power of laughter, the power of humor. Uh, in the 1980s, I was teaching a writing class at the University of Michigan. One of my students was Boris, who had been an emigre from uh, Soviet Russia in, in the 1980s. And, one of the things he smuggled out of Russia were jokes. He smuggled jokes out of Russia because jokes were the currency of telling the truth. And um, he had a bunch of them. I said, Boris, these are fabulous. Let me help you kind of clean up the English and so on, and we can, um, you know, submit them to the uh, Ann Arbor News. Boris says, no, playboy. <laughs> You know, so we sent these jokes off to Playboy, and three days later I got a call. We love these jokes. We want to publish them. And uh, for years I was getting residuals from the Reader's Digest who were reproducing these jokes. The one I remember, the one I remember many of them, this is one of my favorites. Um, these two comrades are waiting in line. It's hours and hours, and finally one of them just freaks out. He says, I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to go and shoot Brezhnev, who was president of Russia. And off he goes. An hour later, he comes back. And his friend says, did you shoot Brezhnev? He goes, no, that line was longer. <laughs> so comedy like that gives us heart. You know, there's, uh, there's plenty of comedy that creates separation, that puts us back to sleep. We want to be awakened. We want to be awakened at the greatest time in human history. We are, we are coming to, to recognize that we are a species. We're on a hero's journey. We are the hero and heroine of this amazing story. And in, uh, in healing this story, we will be able to create an entirely new game on this planet. So that's where we are. And you know we're really all on the front lines, provided we wake up Swami has a four-step program. I'm working on a new book called Evolutionary Upwising, <laughs> Human Manifesto for an Awakening Species. And uh, the four steps are wake up, wise up, grow up, show up. Waking up to the connection that we have. Waking up to who we really are, spiritual beings in a physical body. Um, waking up to uh, what our friend uh, Timothy Noble says, that we have more than enough. Very important, very important awakening. Uh, then we wise up to the power of love. We, we wise up and we rise up to who we really are. We grow up to become responsible adults of good rather than merely children of God. And we show up with our gifts ready to make a contribution. I love, I love the idea of bucket list. How many people have a bucket list? Isn't that cool? People say, what's a bucket list? Well, it's uh, all the undertakings you wish to undertake before getting overtaken by the undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> and so as individuals and as a community, and this is a very, very vital community, um, you're really on the, on the front lines and uh, of this amazing evolutionary upwising and awakening. So I want to thank you so much for who you are and for being here. Thank, thank you. you.